the introductory part, the findings and the conclusion. Uh, start off with a statement of the problem, the research questions, the objectives of the study, the theory used, and the research process. Okay, so these are the Karen refugees. Uh, Burma, Myanmar has many ethnicities, Karen, Kareni, Thai, Burman, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the people in the villages moving out because of the years of internal armed conflict inside Myanmar. So many leave the country, many go to the border states in Thailand and come to the US of Western Europe. Problem statement. There are problems in refugee service. You'll see actual photos of places that we uh, visited for our research. Uh, this is one in Rockford. Uh, with different refugee service groups. I'll explain what the problems are. One, they're well-intentioned people who want to do good, provide services to others, but maybe they do not fulfill the needs of the people on the ground, the refugees. And number two, the service providers consider refugees as outsiders <coughs> who are therefore alienated, who know nothing, so you have the two worlds, us and them. Okay, third problem, therefore, the statement would go, uh, maybe we have to have alternatives. What they're providing is not the right kind of services. So what are our research questions? So one, what's out there? What are the services provided to the refugees in the US? Second research question, so what are the alternatives to the mainstream services? And objectives, therefore, will look at both the traditional, this is in another place in Rockford, this is in Indiana, uh, where the Karen refugees are. So we're looking at two ways by which refugee services are given. Assumptions, we say people of culture, but sure, but cultures are not metaphysical, non-historical, and non-changing, rather the opposite. Cultures change through time, okay? And we are both scholar practitioners. We work in the field as well as do research and we try to combine both worlds, the real world and the academe, therefore coming up with research that has policy implications. What are our frameworks, the way by which we look at the work? Two, one is Paulo Freire and the other is Howard Zinn, uh, both of whom stated that we cannot just study things as they are, assuming uh, there's a theory that we can apply to everything. Rather, we have to start with the context upon which uh, actions are taken. So we don't start with an abstract way of saying uh, providing services, but we look at the reality first. So one is the assumption of empirical research, looking at the reality first, therefore inductive. The other way is deductive, you assume Things can be done based on the theory, and you go for it, you see, it's theory driven. The other approach is theory producing. There are different ways of looking at the world. So, we're there for saying you have to look at the culture, class, ethnicity, and gender. We cannot just say one size fits all uh, service. And we were engaged in dialogue uh, with uh, refugees. We do not consider them as know nothing. We are co-learners, and we are co-constructing knowledge and services. Okay, so th that's our bias. The two things we, are, we looked at were the farm project and the weaving project in, uh, uh, for the current refugees. Okay, more, we assume that if you have power, then you dictate what knowledge will be given. That's from Michel Foucault. So it's the all-knowing service providers who know what should be imparted and what is right. Okay, that, that's a bias. And the othering, therefore, we are the knowledge holders. You are our bridge, and the others are the know-nothing people. We are imparting knowledge to them. We are the do-gooders. It's, it's a critique, it's a bias upon which we do our research, and our policy implications we base, we base on that. We had site visits with people who came here to study uh, both refugees and immigration issues, people who were indigenous and Muslims from another part of the world, trying to understand how people deal with that in the US. 
and I was actually involved in what they were doing, seeing uh, what was out there. <coughs> and we had a community dialogue with some service providers and looking at documents, existing literature on the refugees from Burma. So that's the research process. So field visits. One is the Catholic Charities in Rockford. Uh, this is their office uh, where we sat and talked with the service providers. And then, you know, historically, Jane Adams did a lot of good things for the people coming from Eastern Europe, basically, Poland, everywhere else from Europe. So looking at the literature and going to UIC and looking at what she did in those days. And then Heartland Alliance, if you just look at the name of the organization, there's a heavy bias, there's a heavy bias in favor of human rights, not just human needs. You will see this is very critical later. And then interaction with the people who knew about the situation. Uh, my co-author, Maria, is sitting right here. We had a dialogue with her. Now, and the fourth one is the Refugee Sur uh, Resource and Research Institute. Uh, of which Maria is the director. And I happen to know Elise Newman. I bumped into her, she was helping uh, as a volunteer with the Chin Farms in, uh, in Indian, Indianapolis. I'm not Burmese, I'm not Karen, I'm not, I'm not Burma. But uh, we just bumped into each other and while she was doing her volunteer work. And this is the Karen Farm of uh, my friend Maria, also in Indianapolis, and dialogue. So we talk with uh, the community leaders, both the Karens and the non-Karens who were providing services. And we had a meeting in the community hall in Indianapolis uh, about what they were doing uh, to empower the refugees. And we visited the group called AFI, Alliance of Filipinos for Immigrant Rights and Empowerment in Chicago. And also compared notes how they dealt with immigrants and refugees. So just by the names of the organizations, you see a heavy bias. Some would be basic needs, oh, you need food? Okay, we'll give you food. Others say human rights, that's already a very different focus. Another would even say empowerment. You see different biases in the service being provided. And the Rock Valley, the Valley College Refugee and Immigrant Service. Okay, it's inside the college they were providing this service. Okay, and we actually were observing how they were teaching the current refugees what to do. Okay, so this is the typology we created. It's our original, uh, giving the critique on the different ways by which refugee services are given. The government uh, has at least two agencies, Office of Refugees Resettlement and Department of Agriculture. Uh, traditional approach is you are refugees, you're outsider, you have to act and look like us, and eat like us, and dress like us. <clears throat> and you need a job, like everyone else. I'm oversimplifying a complex issue. And then you have different groups there. They're doing basically traditional things. You need a job, you need money, you need housing. And then other groups are more open to non-traditional approaches for different refugees, culturally appropriate. Why are they able to do that? Because they do not implement all of the projects. Like you can apply for funding, uh, compete for a grant, and do services. And the people who apply for grants say, excuse me, maybe we should be culturally appropriate. Let's ask and talk with the current refugees. What are their needs? Instead of, no, oh, we know what your needs are. Instead of imposing the need, you ask them, what are your needs in a dialogue? There's a difference in the approach top-down and horizontal. Okay? Very different approaches to dealing with refugees. And uh, Eritrean, Iraqi, Somalian, and other refugees. Okay, in human resource development, HRD has three major areas. You can have a whole textbook, it took me 500 pages thick. They will say there are three major areas. Performance, learning, and change. Okay, are the main themes in HRD, not HRN. It's different. And uh, we will see how these will link to the services provided. And we also listen to the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, uh, gave a speech. And uh, someone from AFIRE came to NIU. 
and also with the National Korean American and Service uh, uh, and Education Consortium in Chicago. Dr. Son Sik came here uh, for talk, and we even had <laughs> somebody on uh, political assignment. Okay, so we look at the bigger, broader context when dealing with uh, the organizations working on uh, refugee rights. So case studies. One is a farm project. This is the actual farm. This is the landlady. Uh, she owns the farmland. And we were uh, engaged in participatory action research. Second one is their weaving project, okay? both of which are in Indiana. So we look at the farm project and the weaving project. Uh, now, so Maria and I uh, uh, work on this research and back and forth. She came here, I went there, we went to the farms and visited different organizations. She runs the uh, Refugee Research Institute and uh, I'm here. So we visited both in Illinois and Indiana. This, these are the landowners and we'll look at the farm that we'll find later. So the findings. First of all, there are about 10,000 refugees in Indianapolis. Uh, I chose this over Rockford because my co-author is in Indianapolis and she's the director. I felt she had more uh, knowledge. So we look at the literature from all over. Uh, and even Ms. Uh, Haitian Turks were on the border of Turkey and Georgia <coughs> from all over. And half of whom, more or less, are women and girls. So if we provide refugee service, we should think, what about gender? Oftentimes we forget the women's issues. <coughs> okay, so many come here, uh, they may have very different countries and ethnicities, but many of them come here as estranged foreigners, as alienated. Okay, so the services we found, talking to different service providers, first one, the traditional services, uh, they provide basic needs. For example, uh, here, the service providers were teaching the refugees here. The refugees are sitting right here. Uh, how to, and I sat with them and said, can we have a photo with you? Uh, after we had a dialogue. Uh, how you should look at people. And they say, oh, you're dirty. In fact, I was shocked how they were saying, you should not wear this and that. I mean, it could be said in another way, culturally sensitive. They were just saying off the bat, this is wrong, and you should do this. So basic skills, like really, really low, like dumb down, like you know nothing level, that's what they were doing. Uh, but you know, we were observing, we were not judging them when we were there, but after we came back, we reflected and looked at how services were provided. Telling them uh, uh, how to shake hands, how to look at people, how to dress up, which is fine if you need to go to an interview. Okay, so <clears throat> the first model is the the all-knowing cultural outsider telling the refugees what is to be done. Okay, that's the first model. It's hierarchical, okay? Because it is the all-knowing service providers telling you, uh, can you believe uh, this is a new phenomenon among refugees and immigrants. The sons and daughters who learn more English than their parents, that's her mom have power situation, now in between. They're power holders because of language. You can see that even when you go to groceries, little girls pulling their dad, their dad say, for example, quiero uh, comprar cigarillo. A daughter says, oh, can I have marble for my dad, please? The dad has no power, the dad relies on the daughter. You see that everywhere. And this is the same thing, he's very powerful among the Karens. So you are disrupting social order and hierarchy among the refugees. Like in some cultures like the Karen, there's hierarchy, you respect your parents. She is telling his mom what to do. Like this is shocking for a in cultural insider. By a cultural outsider teaching them, oh, you know English will pay you work for us. Okay, now teach your mom. You don't do that in public for your mom. For a Karen, you don't. Okay, so we said, okay, that's model one. We saw it in action in our own eyes. It's not in the literature, it's in our eyes. 
Uh, we saw how they were doing this. But the good thing is, people need a roof. People need some food on the table. You need to have medical services. But they teach you how to be American. One, it's one way. This is how Americans expect you to be. But should we learn about them? No, that's not part of our service. It's not in the budget, it's not in the objective, in the vision, mission, and goal of our program. And we don't have any uh, component for that in our budget. Resume writing, these are all good. <coughs> and employment, guess where they send them to? To work. Oh, since you're refugees, you're all outsiders, your English language proficiency is low, guess. Sorry? I said agriculture. Agriculture, good guess. Yeah, manufacturing. Oh, all of you work in factory. And I said, and they said, we did unprovoked, we didn't ask. Oh, they're good, they're, they work hard. Automatically, and you know other people, like I was shocked with them telling us, you know Americans, they don't work as hard, like, okay, okay, I didn't ask. No? And then they all work hard and they're hardworking and they're meticulous, especially the women, like, okay, gender, you know, stereotyping again, good in little things, like, stop it, I can't, it's part of the research. You know? So they were telling us all the stereotypes without us asking them. So this is the banking.